All right, you may be seated. Good morning. Um, we are looking at lesson number four of the life of Moses. Previously, we've discussed um, Moses is uh, Moses going into into Egypt for the first time. We looked at the sin that was prohibiting him from moving forward in the will of God, which was the circumcision of his son, and uh, how he was struggling on on fulfilling God's commandment concerning circumcision. Um, because he had a wife who was not a, who was not a Jew. She was not a Hebrew. She did not understand that custom. And that was stopping him from being able to fulfill the rest that God had planned for his life. We looked at Moses' discouragement as he goes into Egypt and he's super thrilled and excited. The first meeting with, uh, with the Hebrews went great. They believed and they showed that they did, uh, they did the signs and the wonders and the miracles before the children of Israel. And they all bowed their heads and they believed. But when it came going to, to, to go to Pharaoh, he hardened his heart and he said, who is God? I don't know who this Lord is and why should I obey him? And he increases the burdens on the children of Israel and, and makes their jobs even harder. And that discouraged Moses because everything was going so good. God, you had told me that this is what's gonna, what, what was going to happen and it didn't turn out that way. The deliverance did not happen. And so he was discouraged and we looked at discouragement and, and being attached to results in the ministry and, and even in, just in our daily life and every aspect when we just are faithful to do what God has called us to do, then that's all we need to worry about. Everything else is on God's hands. But as long as we're doing what God has called us to do, and that's what we, a little bit of what we talked about last week. And then we got into the plagues. We finished up right before the plagues, and so that's what we're going to look on today. Hopefully, we can get through uh, most of these things here. So um, we've only got a, a few minutes here. So let's go ahead and look at Exodus chapter 5. We're actually going to go backwards, and we're going to look at this question. Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2, and it says here, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. Who is the Lord? Is what Pharaoh said. Why should I obey him? I know not the Lord. In this domain, in this world, this, 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 uh, this, this country of Egypt, this is my, I'm the high power here. I'm the one that runs the show. I'm the God in Egypt. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? You see, for all of, for, for, for all of, for Pharaoh, as far as he was concerned, there is nobody higher than him. He obeys. Uh, he's the one that runs, uh, runs Egypt. However, Egypt does have many different deities and different types of gods, um, during this time. Um, and, uh, actually it's said that a lot of the plagues that we're gonna, we're gonna look into are actually, uh, to, in, um, are against the, 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 the different deities in Egypt. We won't talk too much about the specific deities just because it's not in the, in the word. And so we'll just, we'll just focus on what the Bible says. Um, but traditionally, that's what they say, um, is that the God, the, the plagues were actually against the certain deities that they worshiped in Egypt. But Pharaoh raises this question, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? And that is basically the same question that you and I probably had asked before once we were outside of Christ. That's what the lost are asking right now. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? The world is wondering this question. And they come to their own conclusions. And right now, the biggest conclusion that they've come to is that we are God. We are, I am the God of my life. I am the one that dictates uh, what is truth and what is right and what is wrong based upon what I feel, based upon what I, uh, what I, what I want to do. I'm the one that determines these things. And, uh, so that is the same question that Pharaoh is asking. Many of the, many of the world is asking that same question today. The conclusion ends up becoming themselves oftentimes. But that's why we are supposed to go out like Moses and bring him the light of the gospel. But who is the Lord? And so in response to Pharaoh's question here, I think it's, uh, we see the 10 plagues. Okay, so now let's go ahead and go to Exodus chapter 7. We finished up last week when we were discussing Aaron's rod that became a serpent against all of the magician's rods that became a serpent. And Aaron drops his rod, it becomes a snake, 
And all the magicians there in Egypt said, hey, we, we can do that too. And so they dropped their rods and they become snakes. But Aaron's rod and the, the snake, the, the serpent, ended up eating all of the other magicians' snakes. So um, all, to say that there is none, none pow- no power like God's. There's two supernatural powers present, right? Both, uh, it is not of man's own power that we can turn a rod into a snake. That's a supernatural power above our own ability. And we see that Aaron's rod does that and the magician's rods do that. So there's two different powers here, one being of, of God and, and God's power and the other being of uh, demonic power and Satan and, and, his, uh, and his domain and his world uh, concerning spiritual things. But now we go into, uh, so, then, so with that being said, we're going to go now to Exodus chapter 7. Let's go to verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out, of, out into the waters, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand, and thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness, and behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, and this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Remember that question that Pharaoh raised. You're going to see this is that so that you can know that he God is God is God. I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying unto Aaron. Take thy rod and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon the streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Let's keep reading. Verse 20. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his serpents, and in all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died and the river stank and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt and the the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart was hardened neither did neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said so the, the magicians do the same thing right they did so with their enchantments And then verse 23, And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians digged round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the river. So we see the beginning of the plagues now are now happening. Moses turns the water into blood and he does this miracle as a sign that says, God is with me. This is the power that I have that, that is here. You ask Moses, who is the Lord of God, uh, who is the Lord God that I should obey him? I'm here to show you that. Let me show you him. Let me introduce you to, to, to my God. And he turns the rivers and all the waters into blood. However, we see here that the magicians, they did so with their enchantments. So they were able to kind of do the same things a little bit there. So they, they, they're able to turn their, the serpents, the, the rods into a serpent. And now they're able to mimic this, this power of turning some water into blood. And so Pharaoh hardens his heart is what it said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house. He didn't eat. He, he, did, he, did he set his heart on that, any of the, the issues? So he looked at it and said, okay. Moses is turning the water in, the water into blood. So are my guys. I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna set myself on this. It's not that big of a deal. And he continues on his, in his life. And all the Egyptians dig round about the river for water to drink. The first point I want to say. Well, the first point you can put down plagues of blood and the frogs, the plagues of the blood and the frogs. So we're gonna look right into. Uh, let's go look into this frog one here. Uh, verse 15. It says, No, no, no. no sorry. Let's go to verse uh, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders 
with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house and into the bedchamber and upon thy beds and into the house of thy servants and upon thy people and into thine ovens and into thine kneading troughs. So these frogs is the second plague. They're just going to come and they're going to be all over the place. You can't, you can't get rid of them. You go into your house, you go down to, to sleep on your bed, they're going to be in your bed. You try to go and cook something in the kitchen, they're going to be all over the stove, they're going to be all over your dough, they're going to be everywhere and you can't get rid of them. And so this is the second plague. It is the frogs. And um, we see here that verse 6, And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And look, verse 7, And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. So, so far, neck and neck, these, these, these magicians are matching this power that uh, Moses and Aaron are bringing. They're bringing up, they're making their rods turn to serpents, they're turning water to blood. They're bringing these frogs and they're getting these frogs involved as well. They're bringing the frogs the same way that Moses and Aaron are. And then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me. He got tired of it. And from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat? So this is the first time Moses is hearing Pharaoh respond in this way. Right? He didn't respond this way when he, when he turned the waters to blood. But now that the frogs are here, here uh, Moses is finally hearing the words, I will let them go. Entreat for me, go and get with God, get rid of these frogs, and I will let the people go. This is the first time that's happened. And so Moses says, okay, sweet, glory over me. Tell me you tell me when, when you want these frogs gone, and, and, and you know, we'll make that happen. And, and verse uh, number 10, he says, and tomorrow is what Pharaoh responds. He said, Be it according to that word that said, Be it, um, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. So this is the theme here that we're looking at, is that every single sign that is displayed is to answer Pharaoh's initial question, Who is the Lord? And so God is giving Pharaoh every single reason for you to believe that I am God. The God of Moses is the one true God. And so that's what's, that's what we see here. Every time there's a, there's a, uh, a plague in response, Moses says this, um, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto our Lord, the Lord our God. And the frog shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. They're going to go back to where they came from. And, uh, and so verse 14, let's go down. And they gathered them together upon heaps and the land stank. So what happens is all the frogs died and they start putting them in piles in the roads and in heaps. And it just made all of Egypt stink. Verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart. And hearken not unto them, as the Lord had said. And so what happens is, Pharaoh gets fed up. He says, I'm done with the frogs. I'm done with all, I'm done with all of the, the, these plagues. Listen, Moses, go and entreat for me. Get with God. Ask him to get rid of these frogs, and I will let the people go. And Moses says, sweet man, you just say the word. When do you want it? And, Moses, and Pharaoh says, I want it done tomorrow. And so he says, okay. And so Moses goes and treats with God. He ends up getting the frogs out of there. They put all the dead frogs in the streets. All of Egypt stinks. And then there's a respite. And that respite is a... Um, it's a period of rest. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 I was dealing with all these frogs. Now they're gone. And we have this period of rest where we're not really dealing with anything. And during that period of rest, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and he went back and said, you know what? I'm not going to let him go. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. So real quick, sub point uh, number one I want to say is that we're, we're going to go back to the river here and the rivers of blood is that instead of obeying the call or the commandment to let the children of Israel go, what, do the, what, what does Pharaoh do? He ignores it. So what do the Egyptians do? They begin to dig, uh, dig up water from the side of the river and that's how they ended up getting fresh water. Instead of giving in to what God has instructed for Pharaoh to do, they begin to just, just to find some sort of ways of convenience instead of just fully obeying what God had told them to do. Instead of letting Israel go, you can get all your water back and obeying what God said. No, we're just going to dwell in this stinky, bloody water and we're going to drink from the fresh water aside of the, on the side of the, um, 
on the side of the, of, the, of the river here. And so what I want to say is when you're suffering from the penalty of your disobedience, the best step is to simply obey God instead of mildly relieving yourself from the consequence of your disobedience by taking matters into your own hands. Okay, so let's put, this in, let's, let's put it into practical terms here. When you don't handle your finances wisely, you don't do what the Bible says, you're not a giver, you're not tithing, you're not being a good steward, and then you end up spending all of your money and you're broke, what you don't do is go and get an advance on your paycheck to mildly relieve yourself from the consequences of your actions. What you don't do is start spending money that you don't have and putting it all on credit. And you're starting to mildly relieve yourself because of the consequences of your own actions. You just simply do this. Okay, God, I'm going to do it your way. And so God says, let my people go. The Pharaoh says, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, who, who, is the Lord, who is the Lord God that I should obey him? And then they start digging, getting, getting water, fresh water from the side of the river, and they're digging the well. So instead of just digging for a well, just obey God, and all of this can undo itself. Okay, the, uh, the magicians, they, we see that they performed the same plagues. Pharaoh asked for relief uh, from the frogs, but then it says, it, uh, because of the respite, there's a temporary delay, there's a period of rest. When there was an ease, there was, when there was that ease, that moment of rest, and everything's good now, Pharaoh went back to the way that he always went, and he hardened his heart and did not hearken unto the children of Israel, and he did not let them go. You see, oftentimes what happens in moments of distress and in moments of when there's troubled waters, we want to cry out to God and say, okay, okay, God, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll do what you have asked me to do. And then God says, okay, I'll intervene, and I'll calm the sea a little bit. And then when things get calm in that, in, in, in that time where there's a little bit of rest, Oh, it wasn't so bad. I was worried for nothing. We go back into the ways that, we, that God was trying to get us from in the first place. And oftentimes you see this when people are lying to God in a hospital. God, if you just intervene, if you just heal my, my family members, if you just heal me from this issue, God, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. And so finally you, God gets obedience out of you. And then you get, oh, yeah, that was some good medicine. You know, I, I, I was overreacting. God didn't really answer my prayer. And so then there's that, that respite, that moment of respite. And then we go back into our ways, thinking that we're going to fool God there. Lie to God. They lie to God in the prisons. We lie to God in, in circumstances in our own life when financial hardships come. And, okay, God, I'm going to start tithing. And finally you get everything settles down. And, and then you, get, you, get the pay, you, get, you make it to the next paycheck. And you know what? And you just, that moment of respite, we go back into our ways that God is trying to get us uh, away from in the first place because of respite. Ecclesiastes, four, uh, Ecclesiastes four, five, chapter 5, verse 4 through 7, it says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that, should, than thou, than that sh thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before thee an angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Don't just say things to God. Don't just make these claims and these, and the, and these vows unto the Lord and say, God, if you just intervene in this thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey you. I'm going to do what you've been wanting me to do. And then God does it and he listens and you move and, and your prayer moves God's hand and there's respite. And then you don't keep up your end of the bargain. You don't keep up, hold up your vow. You see, sometimes in our, God, God has been asking you to do something and, 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 we just put it off. No, no, we harden our heart kind of like Pharaoh does. And God's been, been, been saying, hey, you need to start being more faithful in church. Or, hey, I need you to, to join this ministry. Or, hey, I need you to witness to this family member. Or, hey, I need you to forgive this person. Or whatever it may be in your life that God is telling you to do. You've hardened yourself to it. You're not going to listen. But then God brings a little bit of chastisement. And he says, okay, if you're not going to listen to me, I need a, I, it's time for some discipline. And you, and, 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 you, and you go through some troubled waters. Okay, okay, God, I've, I get it, I get it, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. 
And then he says, okay, and releases you from the troubled waters a little bit. And that moment of respite, we often turn away from our vows that we made unto the Lord. And that is the opposite of what we should do here. We see that that's exactly what Pharaoh does. And um, because of that respite, are you, have you gone back on something that you promised God because times have gotten better? Because he has been gracious and merciful and has relieved us from the troubled waters or the hardships. I encourage you to get back to that vow that you made unto the Lord. Okay, let's move on. Exodus chapter 8, verse 16. We're looking at the plague of lice, and then uh, we goes right into the plague of flies. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Okay, so now we see that there's lice. This is the third plague. Verse 19. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And so now the magicians, they kind of met their match here. There's a bunch of lice and, whoa, I can't, this, this is something that we can't duplicate. We can't, we can't bring this kind of power to. This, this, is, this is of God. This is the finger of God. So now the magicians are starting to proclaim, hey, God's power is unmatched here in Egypt. And they're, they're, they're kind of looking at this situation and they're siding with Moses here. Pharaoh, this is not, we can't do nothing here. Next plague is the flies. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people and into thy houses and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground wherein they are. So everywhere you go. In the air, you're running into flies. The ground, there's flies. There's, you can't escape it. This just sounds so miserable. It's just so much easier to let the people go, in my opinion. But dealing with all these flies, and, and this, is the, this is the fourth plague here. And, uh, but look at verse 22. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, in, uh, dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of of the earth. And so the children of Israel didn't have to experience these plagues or this plague here. Um, God said, you know, I'm going to separate them. They're going to be okay. They're not going to be hindered or discomforted by, or anything by the plagues now. The, 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 the swarms of flies aren't going to bother them. And uh, so God has separated them, protected them, and has kept them uh, during the, the judgment of this uh, Egypt and, and Pharaoh. Okay? And so Pharaoh says, go, verse, uh, cha- uh, verse 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Once again, Pharaoh gets fed up with it and says, okay, I give in. Verse 26, and Moses said, it is not meet to do so, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? Whoa, almost missed it. He said, okay, go and sacrifice. But then he says, do it in the land. He wants you to stay here. He doesn't want you to leave. The problem with that, Moses is too smart for this, because there are are deities that that, that the Egyptians look at. Well, let me backtrack here and say this correctly. The Egyptians look at some of these livestock as deities. And one of them is a bull. One of them is a lamb. And... uh, and that's what they're, that's what they're going to sacrifice. And that's what the children of Israel are killing. They're going to sacrifice these animals to the Lord. And so Moses is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If I do that here, you're going to look at the things that I'm doing as a sacrifice, as an abomination. And then that, what's that going to do? That's going to cause anger upon Pharaoh and, and merit grounds for him to slaughter all of Israel because of the sacrificing in the land. So you see that this compromise that he is trying to have with Moses actually will end up becoming to the children of Israel's own detriment because whole submission, full submission should not be compromised here. This is not what God has uh, has commanded for, for Pharaoh. He said, no, let my people go. And Pharaoh's trying to negotiate the terms here a little bit and say, you know what? You guys, you guys can do your thing. You guys can sacrifice if you'd like to but you got to do it here in Egypt. And and Moses says, no, 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 no. That's going to be an abomination to the Egyptians before their eyes. Will they not stone us? You guys are going to kill us if we do that. 
We will go three days, verse 27, we will go three days into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away and treat me. Verse 29, And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And look at here, verse 32, And Pharaoh hardened his Heart. So every single time that, that there's a plague, Pharaoh gets fed up. So far, Pharaoh gets fed up with it, right? And then he says, okay, I'm going to do what, you, what you're asking me to do. Entreat for me with your God. And then Moses goes and says, okay, God, remove it. Remove the plague. God does that. And then Pharaoh has hardened his own heart. And he, and he changes his mind, right? That's, that's, what we're, that's what we've read so far. So far, Pharaoh has hardened his heart. Verse 9, the plague on the cattle. We're going to look at the plague on the cattle and the boils. I'm kind of flying through these plagues here real quick because because of time. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and will hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon all the sheep. There shall be very grievous murrain. So this next plague is going to be against the livestock of Egypt. Okay, very significant. Um, okay, and so we see here, now let's go to the, um, uh, well, let's go to verse, verse number six. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Verse seven, and Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. So we just see Pharaoh's just hardening his heart. So far, that's what it's been. He's just not giving in, hardening, constantly hardening. Plague of the boils. Um, let's go down to verse, verse 10. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil, breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. So then he takes the ashes, this next plague, is he, and he throws it up in the air, and the wind carries it over into Egypt, and all those ashes ended up touching all the Egyptians, and that ended up becoming boils on their, on their, on their feet and on their knees, and, and it just because it was a nasty, uh, a nasty, a nasty plague. And then um, look at verse 11. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boil was upon the magicians and upon all of the, Egypt, and upon all of the Egyptians. And now look at what it says, verse 12. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. The Lord hardened um, Pharaoh's heart. So real quick. Let's go back and look at the previous time that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And so Pharaoh is hardening his heart. And I, and I wonder, perhaps, perhaps this exchange early on with Moses is Pharaoh's, almost like Pharaoh's burning bush call, if you will. He has this encounter with God through Moses, and Moses has a Moses has the commandment that God has instructed Pharaoh that this is what I want you to do. And now Pharaoh has a decision. Am I going to obey God or am I going to reject his instructions that he wants from me? And God has given him time and time again to submit unto what he has told him to do. But Pharaoh is hardening his heart. He's choosing to reject God's, what God's word and God's commandment over his life. And so and it's almost as if he has the, the he has the own, his own choice here. He has his own choice, and we'll, we'll come we'll come. Well, I'm going to come back to that because it's very significant. Let's go to Acts. Um, well, you know what? Um, in Acts chapter nine, there is a conversion that is made, a very important conversion to all of Christendom. Right? It's the conversion of Saul. Saul gets saved, and Jesus says this. He says, "It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, isn't it, Saul?" And so. What that means is what, what a prick was. It always, I always wonder what that was. And what a prick is, 
it's a it's a rod it's an iron rod it's a and, and it's got a spiky end and the guy that's plowing that's 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 leading the um the um the oxen to plow the field he's holding this 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 uh, rod this the spike towards the oxen so that if he's resting too long he'll prong him and he'll get him to keep moving forward with the plow and the oxen sometimes they don't like it they kick it and when they kick it it hurts them even more because they're kicking it now it's force on force right and they're kicking it and Jesus is is is, is utilizing that illustration with Paul's uh with Saul's um conviction of the spirit he said, it's hard for you to kick against that, right? I'm, I'm pronging you. I'm, I'm prompting you to go this direction, and you're fighting against it, and it's only affecting you. I'm, I'm just here. You're just going to... When, when the oxen kicks the prong, it doesn't do anything to the guy that's driving it, right? It's just, it's hurting itself. And so it's hard to kick against the pricks, isn't it? And here's, and here's, uh, here's Pharaoh, perhaps this whole entire time, He's kicking against the pricks. I really should do this. I really should. Man, I'm putting all my people through this. We're draining our economy through this. We're, we're destroying our land because of this. And he's fighting against himself. Just not giving in to the pricks that God has for him. And so he has hardened his heart all the way up into the point where God intervenes and says, I'm going to harden your heart. I gave you your choice, you had a chance, and now it's time for me to intervene. As we look at the plague of the cattle and the boils, the, I mean, the plagues of the cattle, yeah, the cattle and the boils, land of Goshen, they're severed again, Israel is unharmed. Now the magicians, they can't even stand before Moses. So it got that they were contending with him neck to neck, then they couldn't keep up, and now they can't even stand against Moses because of the boils. And um, we see here that... Uh, it's an example of the power of the op- of of the power of the opposition. When they're up against the power of God, they cannot stand. And it's early on, it looks difficult. Early on, it looks like yeah, these this this spiritual opposition has got a hold on me. But as you stand firm with God and you and you and you and you and you put on the whole armor of God and you stay in the fight, you're going to see that spiritual warfare, the opposition has nothing against the power of God. It just crumbles. And so the Lord here, moving on, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, I used to be so, it used to just irk me because I could not put it into what I believe, right? Sometimes, and I didn't get to have a full understanding of, 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 of certain things in the scriptures. And a lot of people are afraid of Romans chapter 9, but let's just... Um, Let's look at it. It's, it's the Word of God. And uh, it's Bible, and we don't have to be afraid of it. No, Romans chapter 9. Let's go to verse 15. <clears throat> well, let's start at 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So it's up to God. That shows mercy, right? It's not based upon what we can do to earn God's mercy. God is just merciful, right? It's, it's, it's up, to who, up, up to God that shows mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he will, he will hardeneth. Thou will say un, then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath rested, resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And so we see here that God says that he raised Pharaoh up to be a, uh, to, um, he raised him up that he might be declared throughout all of the earth. So that's what God had created Pharaoh for. He said, Pharaoh, I've created you so that my name can be declared throughout all of the earth. That's what it said. And so we see here as we're looking in this story that Pharaoh had a chance to obey God's call, but he continued to harden his own heart. And then it says, well, now I'm, 
I'm the potter and I have control over this clay and I can harden whoever I want to harden because Pharaoh, I created you for a purpose and now I'm going to harden you. And perhaps, perhaps, we came, into a, we came across a situation where Pharaoh, God was going to get glory from Pharaoh if he had obeyed him, but now Pharaoh has hardened his heart and he is, now God's taken over and says, okay, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to harden your heart now. We're going to take this all the way into the end, and I'm going to get glory out of you no matter what. Whether you obey or whether you don't obey, I'm going to get glory out of you because I've made you for a purpose. And now God is intervening, and now God is hardening his heart. You follow that? And so um, we see here that Pharaoh's heart previously, he was, he was the one that was hardening it. Now it's God intervening, and now God is hardening it. Hardening it. And God decides, I'm going to make you a vessel unto wrath so that I can, I can ha- get glory from you because that's why I created you. And you can ignore the prompting of the Spirit in your life. You can ignore what God has wa- wants you to do in your life. But God is going to get what He wants out of us either way. Somehow, some way, it's up to Him. It's beyond our knowledge. It's beyond our ability to know. But God is going to get glory from our life, the way what He created us to do, either way, whether you obey or whether you disobey. You follow that? And so, Jonah, God's going to get glory out of you. It's either You're either going to go willingly or you're going to go through the belly of the whale. I'm going to get what I want out of you. That's what I created you for. And so we can either submit to the will of God and line our will with his will, die to ourself and say, it's not my will but thine, O Lord, and we can follow God like that, or we can, uh, we can harden our heart and we can go through the belly of the well. Amen? You follow that? Uh, we can harden our heart. God's going to get the glory. We can either be a vessel unto honor or a vessel unto wrath. It's, up to, it's, 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 it's almost, almost to say it's up to us. Not quite sure. Um, there's still some questions that I have in that passage there. But another, um, what ends up happening here is we see that God, this story of, of, of Israel being delivered from Egypt ends up being proclaimed throughout all of the land for generations to follow. The, 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 uh, in, 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 um, in Joshua, let's go, let's go to Joshua chapter 2. We're almost done here. I've got to fly through this. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 2, and we go to verse... Uh, Verse 11, this is Rahab talking to the spies that are, in, that, are in, uh, that are in Jericho. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is a God in heaven above and in earth. Go, go up. Verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So God, there, there are people witnessing this Red Sea or hearing about this story and it's bringing the fear of God upon them so that God can get glory. And so we see here that God will do that. God can turn your life into a vessel unto wrath. So that others can see it and witness it and say, oh, I better submit to the Lord. And that's exactly what we see here with Pharaoh's life. That's exactly what we see with those kings and, and, the, and the other things is that do not be on the other side of God's wrath. Um, that's no bueno. Okay, and so let's, uh, so we got the plague. Of, let's go back to Exodus and we're going to go to the plague of the hail, the plague of the hail, and the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, and that it was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel, where there was no hail. So God had protected his people again. And we see here, we have the, the then, then comes the locusts, and the locusts are going to come, and they're going to they're gonna eat everything that the, the hail left over, and it's going to, so much locusts, it's going to darken the land. And then we've got the plague of darkness, so dark that the Egyptians can't even see each other for three days while the children of Israel had a light. Then we get to the final plague. The final plague, and it's uh, chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 4. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord about midnight, will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the male, and all the firstborn of the beast. 
And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man or beast, that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And he still puts that same difference between the world and his people today. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So God took over and said, This is what's going to happen. In verse 10, And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children Israel go out of his land. And we read on. We're out of time. I'm sorry. We couldn't. We didn't make it. Spent too much time talking. Um, but uh, we know the story. The blood of the spotless lamb is, is, is wiped all over the, the thresholds of the doors. And, the children of, and, 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 and all, the, the, all the children of Israel, they do that. The Egyptians don't, they don't know to do that. And so all of the firstborn in Egypt dies, even Pharaoh's son. And the ch- he says, go ahead and go. It's the breaking point. He actually let them go and released them. And they were delivered beneath the blood of the spotless lamb, crossing the Red Sea. And they're able to live uh, freely in the wilderness, being led by Moses, their man of God, into Canaan land. And God had intervened with them delivering them beneath the blood of the spotless lamb. But Pharaoh, you had your chance, but you didn't submit. And then God took over. Now you're a vessel unto wrath. And so these, this is the life of Moses. I wish I could have gone further. Um, but um, the Lord had something in there for you guys this morning, apparently. So that's the life of Moses, lesson four. Uh, I'll be gone the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a pastor, well, either pastor or somebody, not sure. Um, but... Um, uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll, we'll see you guys the rest of uh, the rest of the, the rest of the minute, services to follow. Let's pray, Lord Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for the Bible, Lord. As it, we can take, we can look into it, read it, see the warnings that are in it, and uh, obey. And um, help us, Lord, to uh, not fight, not to kick against those pricks as your Spirit, as you lead us, Lord, in our, in our life as we dwell on this side of eternity. Lord, we pray that you would. Uh, that you would help us to have hearts that don't harden uh, to your instructions, to your word, to your leadership, whether that be through the Bible, your spirit, or through your, our spiritual authorities placed over us in our lives, Father, but that we would be uh, have tender hearts, Lord, that want to follow you and do exactly what you want us to do, Father, that you can steer us any which way and we will obey, Father. We thank you so much for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, for your love and uh, for the scripture that we can learn from. We bless, bless the rest of our services to follow. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.